Life can be a real adventure. Hot, fast, slow or sad. Maybe sometimes even filled with ups and downs. But according to psychiatrists, any part of life can be labeled a mental illness. Really, like what? Let's say you're upset after a bad breakup. Well, that could be labeled depression. What if you're nervous before speaking in public? Anxiety disorder. Or being really talkative and super active. Manic. That sounds a little crazy. It does. But how much does this really happen? Let's go ask. How many people do you know that have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Diagnosed with a mental disorder? Um, God, off the top of my head, maybe one person that I know who's been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Probably just one. So, yeah. Maybe two or three people, maybe in the three or four range. Four? Four or five? Maybe five. Six people in the household. Six, seven. Ten. A dozen or so. About 20. How about 30? It would definitely be in the hundreds, for sure. The total number of people that I know in my, in my lifetime has been diagnosed with a mental disorder probably fall around the range of of 100 to 150, and I'm 23 years old. Wow, but where are these disorders all coming from? From Psychiatry's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's 943 pages long and covers everything from depression and anxiety to stuttering, cigarette addiction, fear of spiders, nightmares, problems with math, and even disorder of infancy all reinterpreted and many falsely labeled as a brain disease. But people do have serious problems in life. Absolutely, but psychiatrists reduce them down to something wrong with your brain. So let me get this straight. Psychiatrists have a book of life problems reinterpreted as mental disorders? That's right. Wow, then it must be backed up by a lot of science. You'd think so, but it isn't. Psychiatrists at one of their recent conventions admitted to it. Listen to this. DSM is made up by committees of men who have political opinion, and women too, who have biases and, and political opinions. Uh, and so there isn't nearly as much science in DSM as there ought to be. Like in the previous one, people had a meeting in the bathroom and they decided that something should be in there and then they went, would go and propose it to the whole committee. You have this kind of uh, lumping together of several, uh, uh, of several observations. And when you get enough of them in one tent, you got a diagnosis. DSM system is not uh, the real system of di diagnosis. A lot of the disorders that are in there haven't necessarily been rigorously validated. It's just the best tool that we have available, but it is not perfect. It's so useless that if you give me a patient and the DSM, I'll make at least 20 diagnoses on the same patient. You have to take it with a grain of salt anyway. It's actually getting more and more complicated. We're left with diagnosing things on the basis of checklists and questionnaires, which leaves us sort of out of, as you said, uh, the rest of medicine um, because we don't have a biological uh, test. Amazing. The lack of science in the DSM is actually an open secret. Here's what some professionals have to say about it. The DSM is a sham. It's been um, described as a house of cards. Why? Because the diagnoses are theoretical. They're not based on scientific measurements. It's sort of a shaky level built on another shaky level built on another shaky level. It is flimsy and that it is um, easily collapsible under the scrutiny of critical thinking. If you just pull one little fragment of the reasoning aside and question it thoroughly, you'll find it doesn't stand up and then that means that the whole organism collapses because you've got some wrong premises in there somewhere. In fact, they're all over the place. It is indeed a house of cards because it's predicated on not a solid structure. It is built to create an apparently legitimate edifice, which results in a diagnosis. But any serious inquiry will show it to be illegitimate. So, if the DSM is not based on science, what is it based on? Well, it started out as a simple desire for psychiatry and psychology to be accepted by mainstream medicine. We psychologists have always desperately wanted to be accepted as a real science, as a true science. Now, what the early psychologists did was they looked around and they saw what other scientists were doing and they decided to emulate them. Modern approaches to classifying psychiatric disorders dates from the 19th century. 
Um, nearly all the clinical concepts we have today originate from that time. Probably the most important of all was a chap called Lamel Kraepelin, who worked first of all in Heidelberg and then in Munich. Never heard of him. Emil Kreplin is known as the father of psychiatric classification. He was the first person to classify what he thought were biological illnesses in the brain. There was dementia precox, which is now called schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, and paranoid psychosis, all concepts that still exist in the DSM today. That's it? Three disorders? Yes, only three. But Kreplin's system soon became very popular. Listen to this. Kreplin's system caught on very quickly, not only in the German-speaking world, but also in the English-speaking world, in the United States and Britain. It caught on because up to that point, nobody had an agreed way of talking about patients. So in the early 1950s, there was compiled diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Now, there are very few statistics in the book. Disorder is used essentially as a euphemism for illness. This is a book which catalogues mental illnesses for which no medical sign has ever been discovered. This primitive pamphlet was 130 pages long and listed 112 mental disorders, small compared to the current DSM, but much bigger than anything Kreplin envisioned. Why so many? Because by defining more and more of life as abnormal, psychiatrists could get their hands on a huge amount of government money. Defining life? What do you mean? Well, things like holding your breath, biting your nails, thumb sucking, sleepwalking, poor efficiency, even homosexuality. That's ridiculous. They added all those just to have people to treat? And more. Then the second version, DSM-2, came along in 1968 and expanded to 178 disorders, again to grab even more government insurance money. To do this internationally, the DSM-2 was specifically written to align with the International Classification of Disease, the ICD, a book extensively used in Europe and around the world that, apart from psychiatric diagnoses, lists real medical diseases. So that's how psychiatric disorders got accepted by mainstream medicine. It was a start, but the DSM-2 was still not scientific, as it was heavily influenced not by actual clinical testing, but by the theories of Austrian psychologist Sigmund Freud. Then there must have been a lot of neuroses in that book, right? Yep but there was absolutely no knowledge of what caused them, nor did they even look for a cause. Inclusion of the disorder in the classification does not require that there be knowledge about its etiology. So in other words, to make a diagnosis, you really don't need to bother with uh, cause and effect. You don't need to know what causes the condition. Wait a minute. If the DSM doesn't tell you what causes its mental disorders, how do psychiatrists discover them in the first place? The answer may surprise you. New diseases are being invented all the time, and I want to emphasize the word invented, because when it comes to psychiatry, mental illnesses are not discovered, they're invented. The way the system works in terms of diagnosis is that every few years, a group of psychiatrists and psychologists sit around in a room and vote on new diagnoses. This is science? I can't believe it. Don't worry, you're not alone. The diseases are voted on? What do you mean? Did you say are they voted into existence? Are voted? As in created. Oh, man. I think that's kind of ridiculous. It's crazy that you would vote. Well, I definitely don't agree. I don't agree with it at all. Mental disorders should be based on scientific research. I have been led to believe that it's all based on medicine and science. So I'm kind of shocked to find that out. <laughs> Me too. There's more. Not only are mental disorders voted into the DSM, but now and then they are also voted out. Take, for example, homosexuality, listed in DSMs 1 and 2 as a mental illness. This is how the editor-in-chief of the DSM-3, Robert Spitzer, explained it. I came up with a definition in 1973 that made it possible to argue that homosexuality was not a mental disorder. On a vote, essentially, at a conference of the American Psychiatric Association, it was removed. Now, did they discover that homosexuality was not a disease through scientific processes? No. It was included for political reasons, and it was removed for political reasons. And the end result is a, is a vote. It's, a, it's a, supposed to a democracy. 
So uh, to call it science is, uh, is a complete fabrication. So the DSM is actually political, not scientific. Right. <laughs> I thought psychiatrists wanted to be seen as doctors. You're right. That's why they had to make their manual look much more scientific. Which it wasn't. So what did they do then? Well, they decided the DSM's next edition was going to be completely different. It was a decision that would change psychiatry forever. If you roll the clock forward to the 1970s in the United States, basically at that time, psychiatry was in very poor shape for a number of reasons. First of all, it was held in very low regard by other members of the medical profession. So psychiatry was the sort of thing you did if you couldn't succeed in any other area of medicine. And people such as Robert Spitzer in America made it very clear that the time had come essentially for psychiatrists, being doctors of medicine, to practice medicine. So if a psychiatrist was spending a lot of time dealing with people who were anxious, depressed, these dilemmas, these problems in living, now essentially had to be redefined. And they were redefined as medical conditions. And their solution to this was to come up with a manual which defined psychiatric disorders more carefully. So hence we have DSM-3, which is the third edition, which was published in 1980. Under Spitzer, Psychiatrists editing the DSM-3 threw out Freudian psychology and decreed that from now on, psychiatry's diagnoses were purely biological. So they finally became scientific? No, actually, not at all. In fact, the political bickering over what disorders to put in and what to leave out of the DSM-3 was even more ridiculous. Here's what one psychiatrist had to say about it. They would squeeze into a room which was about half the size of this one, it was much too small, and Bob would raise a provocative question and people would shout out their opinions from all sides of the room. And whoever shouted loudest tended to be heard. My own impression is it was more like a tobacco auction than a sort of conference. And this is what another member of the DSM decision-making panel said. The low level of intellectual effort was shocking. Diagnoses were developed by majority vote on the level we would use to choose a restaurant. You feel like Italian, I feel like Chinese, so let's go to a cafeteria. Then it's typed into the computer. It may reflect on our naivete, but it was our belief that there would be an attempt to look at things scientifically. Sounds like they had a diagnostic manual that looked more scientific, but had no more science in it than before. Meanwhile, the number of mental disorders in the DSM-3 had ballooned to 259. But to sell the idea that psychiatry was a true medical science, they had to spin it with a really impressive scientific-sounding theory. But with DSM-3 from 1980 on, there was the progressive medicalization of psychiatry and the notion of chemical imbalance was invented and essentially took hold. Whoa, chemical what? Chemical imbalance theory. It was first suggested in 1965 to try to explain how depression might be caused by an imbalance of certain brain chemicals. I'd like to hear this. Joseph Shieldkraut theorized that because psychiatric drugs alter the levels of some of these chemicals, then mental illness must be caused by too much or too little of them. Isn't that backwards? It sure is. It's a little like saying that because aspirin stops a headache, that headaches are caused by the deficiency of aspirin. I see what you mean. But it was just convincing enough to give psychiatry and the DSM-3 the superficial aura of science. As Robert Spitzer put it, Psychiatry felt uh, now, gee, we're more scientific, we're part of medicine. So it worked. Yes, and ever since then, psychiatrists and the pharmaceutical industry have relentlessly promoted this chemical imbalance theory both to the medical field and the public. If you're one of the millions of people who live with uncontrollable worry, anxiety, and several of these symptoms for six months or more, you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder, and a chemical imbalance could be to blame. Pristique is thought to work by affecting the levels of two chemicals in the brain. It works to correct chemical imbalances in the brain, which may be related to symptoms of social anxiety disorder. Cymbalta works on serotonin and norepinephrine, 
Hundreds of thousands of patients have been prescribed Abilify. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Call your doctor. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Prestique is a key in helping to treat my depression. Ask your doctor about Prestique. You come to my office, and I say to you, well, you, you describe what's going on in your life and, and your symptoms, and I say, well, it's clear to me that you've got a chemical imbalance, and we're going to write you a prescription for this. The truth of the matter is there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. There's no test out there that they can depend on that tells you you have a chemical imbalance. There's actually, in fact, dozens of studies showing that there isn't any measurable imbalance. So psychiatrists will explain to patients all the time, this is just like diabetes. In diabetes, you have low insulin, we have to readjust the insulin level. In depression, you have low serotonin, we have to readjust the serotonin level. But actually, we have already proven that there's nothing wrong with serotonin levels. It's completely a myth disproven by our own evidence. I had a psychiatrist. He said that, in his professional opinion, this child had ADHD, a chemical imbalance of the brain. And when he was questioned on the witness stand as an expert witness for the state, he was asked if they had done an MRI. He said no. He was questioned if they had done a CAT scan. He said no. He was asked if they had done any bodily fluid check known to medical science to prove that this child had a chemical imbalance of the brain. He says no. And when he was, when he was asked how he arrived at this ADHD diagnosis, a chemical imbalance of the brain, it came down to that he had counseled and observed this child for two hours. And half of the time was observing. How do you arrive at a diagnosis of a chemical imbalance of the brain by talking to a child and, 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 and observing them for two hours? You don't, okay? It's pure guesswork. Wow, is this for real? See for yourself. Here's what happened when a person with a hidden camera went to several different psychiatrists asking to be tested for a Maybe mental wrong. illness. Do you have any scientific tests? Not that I'm prepared to do this time. I didn't know her. So you getting that I have adjustment, or what is well, it? Well, um, adjustment disorder, mixed emotions. It just means situational stress. It's right, a but, but formal, it's a formal diagnosis. But I'm saying, just where, where do you get that from? I, I take you at face value. In terms of diagnosis, there's no way that I can x-ray or correct it. So it's very hard to have an effective measure. Because whatever's going on, it's happening in there. And we just can't go in and open up you know, somebody's skull and scoop something out to, to measure. Right now, we don't have an x-ray or a blood test. That doesn't mean that the diagnosis is not correct. The diagnosis is for insurance, and I'm not really trying to think too much in terms of diagnosis. I don't really see that as my main job here to make a diagnosis, except there's something to be insurance that's Person. reasonably accurate. But uh, we don't even really know what's going wrong at the point. So all the things that we found were found by accident. I'm stunned. Psychiatric diagnosis is based purely on individual opinion. No matter what they do, they're wrong. Britain's BBC even did a show on this where 10 volunteers, five considered normal, and five previously diagnosed as mentally ill, were observed by three well-known mental health experts who were then asked to determine who was who. Oh boy. Watch this. We think that it's likely that you've had a history of bipolar disorder, is that correct? You're wrong. Okay. We've come to the conclusion that, that at some time you've been diagnosed with a mood disorder. You're wrong. So we were wondering whether at some point in your life maybe that you had suffered from a significant psychiatric problem of some kind or other. Uh, no. Not at all. You are wrong. All right, okay, okay. Three wrong diagnoses in a row. After a whole week of observation, the panel have identified just two out of five disorders. So much for science. You got that right. Okay, I'm in. Uh, and 
I got a pair of compulsive disorders here. Oh. Oh. I have a question. How can psychiatrists call themselves evidence-based when they have no evidence? It goes further. Not only do psychiatrists have no test to prove the mental disorders they label you with, they can't even define what a mental disorder is. No. They even stated in the DSM. Watch this. Although this manual provides a classification of mental disorders, it must be admitted that no definition adequately specifies precise boundaries for the concept of mental disorder. There you go. Unbelievable. But psychiatrists weren't done yet. 14 years after DSM-3, they published DSM-4, and its editor-in-chief has been even more blunt about the term mental disorder. There is no definition of a mental disorder. It's bullshit. I mean, you just can't define it. So even though they admitted they couldn't define what a mental disorder was, a term they used in the title of their own manual, they added more disorders? A lot more. 115 to be exact, for a grand total of 374. That's over three times the number of disorders listed in DSM-1. And in just over 40 years. And this book weighs almost five pounds. That's bigger than a metropolitan phone book. It's a buyer's catalog of mental illness. And with it, 120 million people worldwide have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Wow. But what about the international classification of diseases? Has there been an increase in mental disorders there too? Most definitely. The ICD's mental and behavioral disorder section almost parallels the DSM. Whatever happens in the DSM is mirrored there too. Okay, well, so far I found out there's no test to identify or confirm a mental disorder diagnosis. There's no proof to the chemical imbalance theory and that they don't even know what a mental disorder is. And they admit it, at least to each other. Here's one prominent psychiatrist speaking at a recent APA convention. You're sitting in your office, you see a depressed patient, you have no idea what's the matter with them. And I know all of you think you know the answer, but in terms of evidence, I don't know the answer and I don't think any of us really know. That's astonishing. And yet, they will give you a diagnosis very quickly anyway. This is another influential psychiatrist at the same conference. Jim Burley at the Maudsley Hospital did a study once on how long it took people to make up their mind about the diagnosis after they entered a room. And it was about, how many, David? Uh, it was two seconds? <laughs> it, was, it was a couple of minutes. It was very... A couple of minutes? Yep. Of course, even the then president-elect of the American Psychiatric Association is on record for saying the DSM is pretty much a joke. Well, what does D stand for? I used to think it is diagnostic, but um, over the last few years, I realized it is more like a dartboard. Huh. Dartboard? Are psychiatrists telling their patients any of this? No. In fact, psychiatrists act like they know what they're talking about while keeping the public in the dark. I was sent to a psychiatrist um, who saw me again for maybe about 15 minutes, talked to me how I was doing at seven years old, and I left with a prescription for Ritalin. Probably within the first 15 minutes, he diagnosed me with having an anxiety disorder and um, put me on the prescription medication. The amount of time it took for the diagnosis was, I'd say, probably within 10 minutes is, you know, I was diagnosed with anxiety, with depression, within 10 minutes of speaking to the psychiatrist and I was put on those drugs immediately. I received numerous different diagnoses uh, from different doctors and each one gave me a different drug. I didn't have to undergo any tests. I didn't even have to sit there and I didn't have to ask any questions. It was just, that's, that's what you've got. And this is the drug. They really didn't talk to me. They were always talking and questioning my mother. It was all about getting the information from her and not from me. It doesn't make sense to me. I, I researched it, I done my research, and I still can't fully understand how you can diagnose somebody with a, a short attention span. There was never an explanation. Nobody really knew what it was or why it was caused or how did you get it why did anybody have it and what could anybody do about it you know just here have some medicine and go away and i was put on i mean a horse's dose of an antidepressant called effectual 450 milligrams a day i mean they say if you're on 300 you're comatose it wasn't always ritalin it was went from ritalin to like wellbutrin to concerta 
to Adderall. I remember asking these doctors, is there any other way we can do this? Is there any other therapy? Is there something we can do that won't make me feel so badly, that won't give me all these side effects and, and just horrible sensations through my body 24 hours a day? Is there something else I can do that might be not having to do with medications? Doctor said, no. See, what you have is very complex. You have a chemical imbalance in your brain that the only thing that can correct it is medication. Wow, lots of diagnoses, but all you seem to get is meds. Right. Today, a psychiatric diagnosis really means a psychiatric drug. The whole question then becomes, OK, if we apply these labels, what next? And the what next tends to be you get a prescription. And the prescription is for a drug that doesn't work very well and is toxic. It's like a one-two punch. The, the, the number one of the one-two punch is the diagnostic manual. You've got all these disorders to choose from. The, the two is the treatment. So you've got the diagnostic manual in place, you've got a machinery in place, and then you've got this treatment that um, is there for the taking. For everything you can think of that might seem to be odd behavior, the psychiatry field has a name for it. And then for every name of every diagnosis you have, there's gonna be pharmacology behind it, and they have a pill for it. Let me fan it out and pick a card, and there you go. Here's your label, and there's the drug that we'll give you to go along with that label. 98%, maybe 99% of people will get a diagnosis that justifies the use of a medication and also a follow-up appointment. Because remember, the, the business of medicine, the business of psychiatry, is seeing patients. And the psychiatrist that tells a patient they don't have a problem and there's no medicine for that problem, doesn't have a very busy practice. And that's sort of the purpose of the DSM-345, to provide a diagnosis that can be give, given a drug for that patient. It's a quick buck. You don't need to do a physical exam. You put it in the chart, it's done. Prescribe away, lifetime patient. That's what the DSM is for. Are they saying the DSM is only there to justify drug treatment? I'm afraid so. Wow. So if psychiatry's primary treatment is drugging, there must be a lot of drug prescribing out there. Absolutely. Did you know over 600 million scripts are written for psychiatric medications every year? Whew. But what about the patients who don't want drugs? Actually, the DSM has a category for that, too. It says V15.81, non-compliance with treatment. Now this category can be used when the focus of clinical attention is non-compliance with an important aspect of treatment for a mental disorder or a general medical condition. If you um, refuse treatment, then you probably are mentally ill, ipso facto, by that fact alone. So if you don't do what a psychiatrist tells you to do, that's a mental disorder? That's right. That's downright scary. So why wouldn't they follow the treatment? because the drug psychiatrists prescribe can cause some very strong and severe physical reactions. You mean side effects? Well, not exactly. Drugs really don't have side effects. Drugs only have effects, and we arbitrarily differentiate those effects of the drug that we like, and we say these are the effects of the drug. And those that we don't like, those are the side effects. It's akin to saying that a bomb that comes down on a building kills people and destroys the building, and, and the military general says, oh, killing of the people is really a side effect. No, you cannot separate out the destroying of the building and the killing of the people. And so uh, these are not side effects. These are direct effects of the drug creating disaster. People think antidepressants are going to make them happy. But it's not what they do. They, they numb them down. And then in themselves, there's a withdrawal state from the antidepressants. They just become like robots, some of them. They're not actually able to experience the whole variety and range of human feelings and emotions and, and work with them and express with them and share them with others. Because once you sort of put somebody on a heavy dose psychotic, psychotic drug, I mean, you're just dehumanizing them. These are very potent very toxic medicines uh, cause on themselves diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, cause what's called a metabolic syndrome, trunkal obesity, 
uh, premature hardening of the arteries. They affect the heart and the lungs and the kidneys, and you never know exactly what to expect. Most psychotropic drugs lead to massive weight gain. Some of them, um, like a lansipin, for example, can lead to weight gains of 25, 30, even 40 kilos in a year or two, and that um, is serious. One of the side effects is uh, it affects your, your, your sexual performance. Uh, abilities. In people who are on a lot of medication, um, they're just totally unable to detoxify through their liver, and then other functions of the body shut down one by one. These drugs have on their labels may increase risk of suicide and homicide in people who take them, just like a carton of cigarettes test to say may be hazardous to your health. And there's cases where uh, many people who commit suicide or commit acts of violence are on these medications, which definitely has this type of side effect. You look at the side effect profile is identical to what they're trying to treat, and in some cases worse, and especially in the instance of suicide, then you can see that it's an extremely treacherous area with very, very little actual science behind it. Are you kidding me? These are dangerous drugs. Yes, and there have been thousands, maybe even millions of victims who came to psychiatry for help, but were given drugs that ultimately destroyed them. People such as Candace, on Zoloft because she was nervous before tests. Stephen, committed suicide 19 days after being placed on Prozac. Julie, planning for college, hanged herself after only seven days on Zoloft. Matthew, 13 when he hanged himself. Matt, a 21-year-old on a mix of psychiatric drugs. Caitlin, on Zoloft and Trazodone. Beth, put on Paxil for sleeping problems. Matthew, after starting Lexapro. Charles, on Clozaril. Caitlin, a 12-year-old. Megan, Aaron. Wait, wait, this is insane. Are you telling me all these people who killed themselves had been taking psychiatric drugs? Yeah, an estimated 42,000 deaths a year have been linked to psychiatric drugs. Wow, that's over 3,000 people a month. They should take these drugs off the market. Absolutely they should. But because these drugs are by far the main treatment psychiatrists offer their patients, they downplay the risks, and their patients pay the price. When you get on the psychiatric drugs, you feel just so, like you don't really want to live anymore. Like, uh, just depressed all the time, and you feel sad. You don't feel like you're in your own skin. It almost feels like you just want to come out of your skin all the time. I'd get really bad headaches, I'd start shaking, I wouldn't sleep very well, I'd have nightmares. I had started shaking really bad and it was like uncontrollable, you know, and it's like I don't understand why I shake so much. It brought on the symptoms that I was trying to escape from, um, very severe. I'd go through spells where I'd just be completely just dead. There would not be me there. I'd just be standing there and there would be nothing. I think we all have emotions, happy, sad, you know, situational emotions in life, and it didn't allow me to experience them. You don't experience tears, you don't experience a lot of laughter. It just makes life real flat line. I described to, to a, a friend of mine as like waking up in a manila folder and it's a cloudy day. It, everything is boring, unmemorable, unspecial. It changed me. It changed who I was. It changed the essence of my personality. You know, it just started making me worse. And I used, I got in such bad fights with my brother. I scratched his face up and, you know, stuff like that. I started to experience suicidal ideations almost immediately. Um, and I had never had any feeling like that before. I remember when I was at home one day, I had taken my medication and I thought about killing myself and I got really scared, so I ran to my brother and I told him, and he just held me and told me not to give up and to just keep trying. And I actually thought that's maybe the one thing that I do have control over, that I could, you know, I could, I could uh, off myself and uh, I would be out of this roller coaster of an existence. I have been raped. I have been coerced into doing things that I, I do not care to speak of. But just to put it in perspective, even having experienced that, the experiences 
and thoughts and loss of self that I had being put on Prozac was the worst violation I have ever experienced. I'm speechless. People don't even know what these drugs are doing because they trust their psychiatrist. Not only that, recent studies have shown their drugs like antidepressants don't cure disorders any better than a dummy sugar pill, a placebo. So just to recap, not only does the DSM provide the label psychiatrists put on you, but it justifies they're drugging you with powerful drugs that have lots of side effects and don't even work. This is really messed up. Definitely. And yet, they still cling to the idea that they can correct your unwanted behavior with chemicals. Naturally, psychiatry appeals to the pharmaceutical industry, since now they can market and sell drugs for each disorder named in the DSM. I know those marketing campaigns, they're everywhere. Yes, but if you'll notice, they're also marketing the disorder. Drug companies advertise DSM disorders in print, on television, and the internet, urging them to talk to their doctor. They put their paid experts on talk shows to talk about the latest mental illness epidemics. They plant newspaper articles about them and even hire psychiatrists to conduct studies and write papers to give the disorder the air of science. Because if people think they have the disorder, they'll ask for the drug. Exactly. The pharmaceutical industry markets disorders. Because if you can market a disorder, then you've got something to sell your product to treat. So people suddenly come to think of things they previously didn't regard as a disease state as a disease, go to the doctor, see the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist then prescribes the drug that the drug companies have uh, received FDA approval for, and everyone is happy except for the patient. They're all working together, the psychiatrists, the pharmaceuticals, and uh, you know, one feeds the other. So again, job security for the pharmaceuticals and also job security for the psychiatrists. And it's not just drug companies pushing these diseases. One psychiatrist, Joseph Biederman, created and popularized a disorder called pediatric bipolar. He actually said it can begin from the moment the child opens his eyes. Bipolar, as in mood swings for children? Unfortunately, yes. In just nine years, Dr. Biederman fueled a 40-fold boom in the number of children labeled with bipolar, most of whom were prescribed powerful antipsychotic drugs meant only for the most seriously mentally ill. I had no idea. The psychiatrist editing the DSM-4 admitted the DSM's part in creating the child bipolar fad. Well, we learned some very, very painful lessons in doing DSM-4. But inadvertently, um, I think we helped to trigger three false epidemics. Uh, one for the uh, childhood diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Too late now, isn't it? For many kids, yes. And since psychiatrists claim that mental disorders like bipolar can't be cured, psychiatrists and drug companies have made customers for life. So it's a natural partnership. Absolutely. Drug companies provide tons of research money to psychiatrists, who then come up with even more diagnoses to treat with psychiatric drugs. Drug companies have become increasingly dependent on mental illness diagnoses in order to maintain their profit margins. And psychiatrists and increasingly clinical psychologists are more than happy to manufacture mental illness in order to make that happen. Hence, the increase in size of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The strategy is how many people we can diagnose with a particular label that would be broad enough to include a ton of people in it. And the mentality behind that is the sale of the pharmaceutical drug, which eventually becomes the treatment. These drug companies are making a lot of money, and they're spilling that money and sending that money to people that will help support their cause. So it's not a surprise at all that they have infiltrated so many of the committees within the DSM and so much of our own medical education. Wait a minute. The drug companies have infiltrated the committees of psychiatrists deciding on what disorder to list in the next DSM? On DSM-4, 
56% of the committee members had personal financial ties to pharmaceutical companies. The very industry that stood to gain from the 115 extra diagnosable mental illnesses that were voted in. So of course you see more diagnoses that will be treated with drugs. And way more symptoms listed for each one. The whole world is being made crazy, really. And we have these proliferation of categories which have become more and more encompassing, encroaching in ordinary everyday life. There isn't a human being on the planet who doesn't have at some point, if not several points, in a day or a week, distress. It's part of being human. But to say that because you have this distress, that you now are diseased? If you take a godman in India who wanders around with a shawl and meditates for 17 hours a day, drinks uh, rainwater and engages in some kind of spiritual or religious discipline or practice where he might roll on the ground for a hundred miles to a holy place. People there don't persecute those individuals. They accept them as people engaged in religious practices. But here, if you took those same individuals in India and you had them walk across a campus in America, they would immediately be arrested and put into a psychiatric facility because they're manifesting psychosis. This varies by culture. What do we want to strike Jack at everybody? Is everyone going to be the same? What about uh, people that do have a little bit of odd behavior? Is a little odd behavior bad or dangerous? It's just different. You want this thing to cover you know, all manner of uh, aberrant human behavior. Um, so if you can cover every bit of it, then you're going to have a, the, the best chance possible to a uh, billable unit of service. And by the way, just in case you don't fit into any of their categories, there's one more they can stick you with. Naturally. This is uh, number 301.9. 312.9. 292.9. Bipolar disorder, not otherwise specified. Gender identity disorder, not otherwise specified. Disorder of infancy, childhood, or adolescence, not otherwise not specified. Otherwise specified. Not, otherwise not, specified. Specified. not otherwise specified. What the hell does that say? They don't know. It's kind of like a catch-all. It's the, the garbage can for the leftovers. There's even a box for people that don't fit in the other boxes. To me, it's insane. This is like rubbish to me. This is scary to me. This is hackery, quackery, dockery. That's pretty bad science. If your categories are so weak that you need a miscellaneous category to pick up all the loose ends. Yeah, like ADHD, not otherwise specified. Eating disorder, not otherwise specified. Mood disorders, not otherwise specified. You can always use the NOS, the not otherwise specified uh, diagnosis, and uh, that's a billable service. Not otherwise specified means that you're sort of at sea to some extent on the exact diagnosis, meaning it doesn't fit into any of the categories you've established. Unspecified mental disorder. You see, that's considered a disorder. Having nothing wrong with you is now a disorder. That's what this says. Can you believe it? No, I can't believe it. There's a category called unspecified mental disorder, as in, we're not describing it for you. That's a mental illness too? It gets crazier. According to the DSM, you could also be diagnosed with a mental disorder it doesn't even list. You're kidding. Listen to this. These diagnostic criteria and the DSM-4 classification of mental disorders reflect a consensus of current formulations of evolving knowledge in our field. They do not encompass, however, all the conditions for which people may be treated or that may be appropriate topics for research efforts. It's even in the language of the introduction, it's basically saying, we're trying to have a diagnosis to cover all the bases of anything that somebody could come in complaining about, which is, again, entirely backwards from how medical diagnoses are come to. This DSM isn't even close to medicine, is it? Nope, it's pure marketing. God bless the insurance company. You know, you get these multiple personalities, you can call it short insurance company. That's more insurance billing. That's the big money right there. Something still bugs me. If psychiatric treatment is so long, expensive, and ineffective... I know. Who would be willing to spend such exorbitant amounts of money for psychiatric treatment that drags on for years, often for a lifetime, while delivering such lousy results? Exactly. 
Who pays for all this? Mostly government and private health insurance. Right, insurance. In fact, the psychopharma lobby has been very effective in getting laws passed forcing insurance companies to provide mental health insurance equal to regular medical insurance. That's called mental health parity, right? That's it. But economically, this has been a catastrophe. So there's nobody who walks into a psychiatrist's office that isn't going to go out with a label. He's got 374 choices or so based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual list of symptoms. So he's got to fit you into one of those categories in order to get paid. The DSM really should be called, you know, um, how to bill the insurance companies, how to get money from the insurance companies. It's a list of codes and um, there's a number for everything and that number goes on an insurance form and then you get payment for it. The DSM is completely built into the system now because you can't get reimbursed by an insurance company unless there's a DSM diagnosis. You know, a kid wets the bed, you can bill on that. Um, they're gonna have one called a skin picking disorder. You pick your skin, you can, you can diagnose and bill on that. You know, you can always find a diagnosis and you'll always be able to bill. A psychiatrist or a psychologist can go through their book now and find a diagnosis code for just about anything. Everybody would fall into something that they could put a diagnosis on and fraud insurance companies. What a racket. You got it. Every year, the psychiatric industry uses the DSM to rake in $100 billion from the U.S. government and private insurance. And that's just one country. I'm starting to realize just how much the DSM has pushed up the overall cost of medical treatment. I know. The average insurance bill from psychiatrists is double that of general medical treatment. And that raises what I have to pay for insurance. Right, and it wastes taxes too. The Texas State Mental Health Insurance Program was almost bankrupted by one class of very expensive psychiatric drug, normally prescribed for bipolar disorder. Wow, that's a lot of drugs. Sure is. And on top of that, because DSM diagnoses are so arbitrary, another huge and costly problem is insurance fraud. Private psychiatric hospitals have been caught posing as stop smoking and weight loss clinics to get people to admit themselves. Come with me. Paying recruiters $3,000 a head to funnel government insurance patients through their doors. How many more you got coming? A bunch. And holding patients inside as long as possible until their insurance coverage runs out. And all this is for the insurance money? Right. And once patients are enrolled, any diagnosis can be pulled out of the DSM to justify treatment. Check out this hidden camera footage from someone posing as a psychiatric hospital worker. I'll say patient display. That's how my opening is always a classic. Patient display. Um, he's sort of, um, what do you think? You think he's, um... I thought he, I mean, I've interacted with him a lot. I thought he's always appropriate. He's Let's always... Say, uh, but under behavior, what's the good, some good words in here? He's not negative. He's um, he's sort of intrusive a little bit. <laughs> he's not really. He doesn't push limits anymore. Uh, he didn't, he's not really act intrusive. He acts sort of anxious. Focus on the negative. Um, and why, why should we focus on the negative? Because that's how we they get paid. I mean, this is what they told me. I mean, you write what you want to write. I know I got to write for you. So. I know what I have to write. You know what I mean? So that's why I... Like, why do you have to write it? So, this, the, this place can get paid. Oh, okay. It's a business thing. It's not like I'm lying, but I always, like, pull the negative out. Like, You're supposed to. They tell you to. What? The negative? Pull the negative out. Uh, you pull it out of them. Um, that can't be ethical. It's not. And that's just the beginning of the fraud. Psychiatric providers have also been caught billing insurance companies for having them listen to music, watch television, or play bingo, charging for wake-up calls, theater tickets, or trips overseas, or for claiming to treat people who were in jail, in a coma, or even dead. No. Some psychiatrists have even been busted for having sex with their patients and billing it as therapy. That's sickening. As one insurance fraud director said, the extent of the fraud is limited only by the imagination. I had no idea. Not many do. 
Mental health fraud cheats insurers and taxpayers out of $5 billion every year in the United States alone. They should arrest these criminals and throw away the key. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the third edition. Did I mention that psychiatry has also been very successful in using the DSM to infiltrate our court system? The courts, too? Yep. The clinical diagnosis of a DSM-4 mental disorder is not sufficient to establish the existence for legal purposes of a mental disorder. That's a very interesting point. Basically, what the authors are saying here is that the material in the DSM has no uh, utility in the courtroom in deciding guilt or innocence. It should not be used in courtrooms as part of the legal process. Wait a minute. Didn't the DSM just state that it cannot be used to establish the existence of a mental disorder in a court of law? Precisely. And yet, it is used all the time. Yeah, like in the insanity defense. More specifically, not guilty by reason of insanity. How about custody battles, civil commitments, probate court? She doesn't currently suffer from any type of mental illness that would make her a danger. I've read about psychiatrists appearing in court on opposite sides, each using the DSM to bolster his case, yet each accepted by the court as an expert witness. There was no evidence, as far as I could see, for psychosis or delusions. Because he's suffering from narcissistic personality disorder and a delusional disorder, a complete contradiction. It hasn't always been this way. In the beginning of the 20th century, a psychiatrist in a courtroom would be laughed out of the courtroom by and large. Um, today, it's commonly accepted testimony, as long as it's in accord with the DSM. The danger in using the DSM in a court setting is that uh, you're using a vocabulary uh, that the judge or the jury uh, doesn't fully understand. Uh, they are, by concocting these uh, psychobabble words, it makes it seem like there's something there that may not be there. The courts have allowed all this junk science to come into the courts, and they've made case law on it. And once the case law is made, we're stuck with it until it gets overridden. They come in with tests. They come in with their uh, diagnostic categories from the DSM, and they say, we've done tests, we've determined that this person has this numbered malady, and therefore they do. And there's almost no way to pry a judge out of, uh, of accepting that. When a psychiatrist makes a diagnosis in court, is that the person is sent to a mental institution, deprived of liberty, and we have no idea whether he's guilty or not. On the basis of DSM diagnoses, someone is involuntarily committed to a psychiatric institution every 40 seconds. That's just so wrong. And anyone, anytime, can lose everything because of the opinion of a psychiatrist. Listen to this. I went to a stop smoking course at Vanderbilt. And uh, they, uh, the doctor, the, the, the lady that ran the program uh, said that she wanted, she goes, you need to be, uh, we need to get you on a stop smoking medication. So she pre prescribed me Zyban. Well, after the fact, I find out that Zyban is nothing but this really powerful antidepressant called Wellbutrin. Yeah, I stopped smoking, but I, I had no idea the hell, I mean the hell, uh, the hell's gates were being opened. When, uh, when I started taking Zyban. I had been clean and sober for 18 years. I, you know, just never considered that. But something about that, I started experiencing the craving to drink again, and my life fell apart. Divorce, uh, relapse. So then a, a sibling of mine, I got wind of my relapse, uh, wanted to gain control of my pocketbook and my life and uh, found a dirtiest lawyer in town who knew you know one of the dirty psychiatrists and uh, bought and paid for a, an evaluation had a hearing in a court with before i was ever served notice 
And the next thing I know, uh, every right that a human being can possibly have was taken from me. And uh, you have less rights as a conserved person than you do as a criminal. I mean, you are stripped of every right. You can't enter into a contract. You cannot marry. You cannot sue. You cannot even fight the legal system that has involuntarily uh, put you in this. And it was all based on the psychiatrist's diagnosis who never evaluated me. That's unbelievable. He was just trying to quit smoking, but instead got a psychiatric diagnosis and his rights taken away? All his money gone too. Not to mention being incarcerated in a mental institution. But if you think what psychiatrists do to individuals in our court system is bad, wait till you see what happens to families. Children are taken away from parents every day in these juvenile courts because um, a person with a, with a PhD or an MD after their name comes in and says, I've shown ink blots to a person and they may be a risk to a child. Just in my little state of Massachusetts here, there are 11,000 children in captivity taken away from families at any one moment. And uh, almost all of those children are being drugged. And uh, our, our own commissioner of uh, children and families testified under oath that they drug 88% of the children that they take out of the families. 88% drugged? That's almost a sure thing. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. All over the world, psychiatrists are using the court in any number of ways to take away people's rights and destroy families. Just watch. Psychiatry has affected my family through the family law court rulings. The family law court has um, a court-appointed child psychiatrist who, it appears, determines the future of the child. It's just like a business in the court system that they forced you to undergo all of these uh, psychological evaluations and you have to pay thousands, thousands of dollars. But at the end of the day, it has been supported by no evidence, nothing. They would said to me, Deb, you have a choice. Either you bring your son to get medicated or will take your child away from you and put them in a home that they'll medicate your child. And then you, good luck, basically they were saying, good luck, Deb, to try and get your son back, but you'll get him back medicated anyways. And they put her in hospital, and that's when the psychotropic drug, drugging started with Becky. And at that stage, I had no say over it. They refused to let her go. They would not let my daughter go unless she take medication. This was again a recommendation from the psychiatrist that once my son was radically ripped from his home and literally kidnapped and put in a new home with a perpetrator of domestic violence and of sexual assault and is where he now lives, um, this psychiatrist said that he was never to have any counselling and never to see anybody. To have your family just disrupted like that, ripped out from under you, really, your whole life just gone like that um, and then you have to fight every day to get him back it was very devastating in some ways it's worse than a death because it's unresolved and you know what the truth is and uh, you feel like giving up and not fighting back for that custody of that child but you can't. Um, yeah, there's just no justice. This is terrible. They're tearing families apart based on arbitrary diagnoses rampant in the courts. Exactly. So it's unfortunate that the courts have bought into the DSM. It's unfortunate that the whole psychiatric profession is wedded to the DSM. It's unfortunate that the psychiatric profession is in bed with the drug industry, and it's unfortunate that drugs that don't work are the common prescribed drugs uh, for all manner of conditions in children and in adults. Um, it's the wrong way to go. Oh, 
Oh no, not them too. Unfortunately, yes. Children are now a huge target market for psychiatry. The number of childhood disorders listed in the DSM has skyrocketed from three disorders in 1952 to 44 today. That's 15 times more. And yet, the DSM basically admits it shouldn't be diagnosing children. In early childhood, it may be difficult to distinguish symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder from age-appropriate behaviors in active children, such as running around or being noisy. We basically don't know the diagnosis from normal childhood. That's what that's saying. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's what psychiatrists call kids who don't sit still in class, fidget, run or climb a lot. Basically childhood behavior, right? Right. And 20 million kids worldwide have been labeled with some mental disorder. So instead of letting kids be kids, psychiatrists are now telling parents their children are mentally ill and need psychiatric drugs. It used to be that you were on the, the playground, you had to you had the weird kid, you had the, uh, the shy kid, you had the goof off, you had uh, you know, the hyper kid. You can't have that anymore. Now it's all medical diagnoses. For them to come up with new diseases and new issues and diagnosis in their book, it doesn't correct bad behavior, okay? They can give children all the pills they want. It still doesn't correct bad behavior. The thinking still is, you must fit into this mold. And if you don't fit into this mold, there's something wrong with you. Um, and if you're not the person who designs the mold, too bad for you. A child is labeled, and then they're brought to professionals who are trained a very particular way. They're all being trained that if the child fits into this category, then we should consider putting them on Ritalin because that's what they do, that is the protocol. The way the Ritalin will be marketed to the parents is that they will say, this is a drug to calm your child down. What they won't say is that methylphenidate is a form of speed. It's a form of amphetamine, and what we're actually doing is overdosing your child on speed. It's a stimulant. So naturally, it's going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, and you put a kid out on a, on a football field on a hot summer day, and his risk of having a, 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 event of, a cardiac event of some sort has just gone up. You know, I heard that stimulants given to kids diagnosed with attention problems are chemically very similar to cocaine. Yeah, and they have such a high potential for abuse, they're listed by the U.S. government in the same category as morphine, opium, and methamphetamine. So who are psychiatrists gonna drug next, babies? Exactly, they're using what they call diagnostic classification zero to three, or DC zero to three. It's like a mini DSM for babies and toddlers. Listen to this. We already targeted our school children with ADHD and bipolar. That's, that's already done, that was done 20 years ago. And we're moving younger, younger with DC03 to the zero to three age group where they're trying to make popular the idea that it's okay to medicate zero to three-year-olds. The idea of a program to determine whether a child from birth to the age of three has a mental illness is so preposterous, so absolutely insane, that it's simply an additional part of the insanity that is now extend throughout this country. I cannot think of a program that is more insane than that. How are they gonna diagnose a one-year-old or an infant with a psychological disorder? How do they know? You almost have to ask ourselves if our society's become sick. What are we doing to our fetuses, our infants, our children that would make us need to have psychiatric medications. We're rolling dice with life. We're rolling dice with our children who can't even discuss it with anybody. They have no control. They are the helpless victims and the ones who are supposed to protect them and care aren't armed with the facts. If parents knew all this, they'd be furious. You bet they would. But watch out, because the DSM also says you could catch a psychiatric disease from your children. You can't be serious. 
It's in the DSM. Ugh. talk about some of the proposed changes uh, that are suggested for DSM-5. I heard the DSM-5 is even crazier than the DSM-4. You heard right. You've got 374 named diagnoses in DSM. Well, guess what? There's going to be more in DSM-5. Why do we all of a sudden need a, a fifth in DSM-5? Psychiatry wanted to, to broaden the horizons of mental health problems, of disorders. They wanted to stretch the disorders so it would encompass more. And to do that, you know, they're going to add more diagnoses. We need more diagnoses like we need a hole in the head, really. They're not serving a, a purpose for, for mankind, all these diagnoses. They're almost laughable, some of the diagnoses. Laughable? Really? Well, they're talking about hoarding disorder if you don't throw enough things away. Persistent difficulty discarding or parting with personal possessions. Binge eating disorder if you overeat too often. Yeah. Recurrent episodes of binge eating. Oh, and there's skin picking disorder. So it's recurrent skin picking resulting in skin lesions. Those are mental disorders? And for children, there's a new disorder that will scoop up the huge number of kids whose tantrums don't yet qualify for bipolar. They've created temper dysregulation disorder to seem a little bit more mild of the condition and include a lot of the younger population in terms of that diagnosis. And what it essentially does, it just broadens bipolar disorder into a whole other new category. And where they don't fit into bipolar, now they can fit into this other diagnosing criteria. So the net is getting wider and wider. More than you know. They're even considering adding a label for spending too much time on the computer. Internet addiction diagnosis. You know, it's another example of, um, you know, just taking something going on in the popular culture that's, you know, pretty widespread and then finding a way to uh, pathologize it. I know people personally that spend 12, 13, 14 hours a day on the internet or social networking groups like Facebook. So there is something going on there. But is it a condition that we need to then label and drug? Absolutely not. That is laughable. Yeah, until you consider that in China, the government has already set up psychiatric clinics that treat teenagers for, quote, problematic computer use, sometimes using electroshock to cure them. No. And if you think that's bad, there's one more proposed inclusion into the next DSM that is truly chilling. It gets worse? This one takes the diagnosis of mental illness a major step further. Psychosis risk syndrome, known more recently by the convoluted title of attenuated psychotic symptom syndrome. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? A really scary thing that's coming on the horizon is to come up with a whole bunch of diagnoses in there that are looking at people who currently are mentally well adjusted but have a risk of developing a mental illness in the future. They're still thinking they can advance, they can define well before the symptoms develop the um, risk of a person developing a major mental disorder without any biochemical, biological or genetic test or any physical test whatsoever. They don't know the cause of a mental illness. They can't treat it, they can't cure it. So how can they launch a preventative campaign for mental illness? It just logically, it falters. Wait a second. Do psychiatrists really think they can predict a disorder sometime in the future? Let's hear it from them. Now how can psychiatrists know if you're going to have a mental disorder in the future? Again, that we don't know categorically who will develop psychiatric illness in the future. It's really hard to say, actually. I don't know if you could 100% predict for anybody. You can't uh, forecast if one, if, if one will develop a psychiatric disorder. Maybe not, or maybe yes. It's not hard to predict. It's hard to predict. There's no way to predict that. Well, I don't think that nobody knows that. There's no way to tell. Uh, nobody knows? I don't think anyone can know what's going to happen in the future. They obviously have no clue. Yeah, but despite this, they're already proposing to screen kids for future mental illness. So they can treat them now. You bet. I would uh, hate to see us uh, go into the type of society where people are 
locked up uh, for what they may do in the future uh, rather than what they actually have done. Identifying people who are pre-psychotic would be a huge industry. Wow, that's truly terrifying. And the crazy part is, psychiatrists are still moving forward on DSM-5 when some of their most influential openly admit it's completely worthless. Any, any comment on DSM-5? It's of no use to us <laughs> in the rest of the world. <laughs> Even the psychiatrist in charge of the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health is less than enthusiastic about it. I don't do DSM. I'm not involved. So, and that maybe tells you more than anything. And I may not involved with DSM. Right. So the top guy at the biggest government psychiatric organization in the world wants nothing to do with the DSM? That's what it looks like. It's a total sham. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is effectively the story that is being wrapped up in statistics and numbers and categories that with medicine tosses, doesn't fit any of our categories over to psychiatry. Psychiatry says we'll find a category and if we don't, DSM-5 or 6 or 7 will. I think in 2016 we'll be looking at DSM-6 and there will be 1,425 diagnoses and I'll have 900 of them. That is crazy. Yeah, but all of it is designed to fit more and more people under psychiatry's diagnostic umbrella. So they can cash in on even more normal behavior. There you go. <laughs> so if the DSM is so completely useless, why are psychiatrists, oh. Gotcha. It's all about money, isn't it? With psychiatry, it's always about money. And it all starts with the DSM. As Robert Spitzer said, The American Psychiatric Association found out it could make a lot of money by selling it. They've made a tremendous amount of money. Every time they revise the DSM system, the American Psychiatric Association makes a hell of a lot of money. A hell of a lot of money? How much are we talking about? $6.5 million in sales a year. Whew. But it's not just selling the DSM that rakes in the profits. Psychiatrists and drug companies make money every time they use it to diagnose someone. You create disorders so that you can treat it with a drug. It's, an, it's the ultimate money-making machine. How many people can we drug? How many labels can we put out there? How many people can we herd into these labels? and feed them a drug so we can get richer, make more money. There's an inherent conflict of interest and, and that conflict of interest is driven by the desire to make money. More money, more money, more money than uh, one should expect. Huge money in the psychopharm business. If you really did the research uh, on these diagnoses, you'd see that 90% of them or more don't exist. They're not valid. Then that's all of a sudden all that reimbursement from the insurance companies disappears. So we have to cut the money, uh, the money cord, as well as cutting the DSM cord if we're ever going to really succeed stopping this juggernaut from continuing. And once again, it's follow the money and you'll find, you'll get your answer every time. This has been a big eye opener. Uh, let's see, there's no lab test for a so-called mental disorder, which psychiatrists can't even describe in their own manual. The chemical imbalance theory is totally bogus, and yet psychiatric drugs that supposedly balance your brain chemicals are being prescribed to people of every age. Yeah, to the tune of $84 billion a year, adding an overall increase of $10 billion to health premiums in the United States alone. And we are paying for all this through government taxes and higher insurance bills. That's right. The entire psychiatric industry uses the DSM to haul in $330 billion a year. That's a third of a trillion dollars. And growing. It's out of control. Well, the whole system is now a runaway train, but the DSM is the locomotive. And if you took the locomotive off, eventually the train would stop because there'd be nothing more pulling it. We're losing the concept of health. Everybody is sick and everybody's got a condition and everybody needs drugs. You're going to end up with a whole society that's going to basically have to be led around by the hand, but who's going to lead them around? because they're drugging so many of them. In psychiatry, you know in your heart of hearts that you're not really diagnosing. You know in your heart of hearts 
that you can't really treat what you think might be wrong. And you also know that most of what you're dealing with in the DSM is unprovable and unreliable, not a predictable indicator. So what do you have then? Good question. I guess they got nothing. And people are being hurt. Yeah. You're very lucky to go through psychiatry and survive. It really is as simple as that. Only when uh, enough people rip the veneer away and show that it's just nothing more than a Hollywood set is it ever going to fall down. It would be good if all the medical professionals who are really practicing medicine and really trying to help people and um, based on scientific fact and what they can best do to improve the lives of others, um, if they would recognize, just be able to look at this fact, it's hard to look at it, but look at this fact and be ethical and be honest and clean up the profession by getting rid of this fraudulent part of it. Psychiatry. I couldn't have said it better. It's so obvious. We need to get rid of the DSM. It's terrible for society. I know. In spite of its incredibly shaky foundation, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has literally impacted every part of our world. Our schools, our governments. Our court systems. What about the media and the military? Those too. Basically, our entire society. And all without a single person cured. The DSM really is more than just a house of cards. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is psychiatry's deadliest scam.